All right, so Shang-Chi is coming up, and hopefully you don't consider this a spoiler because it's in one of the trailers, but the Abomination is back. So we are taking this excuse to watch what I think is the most underrated film of the MCU, The Incredible Hulk. Now I say that, but I'm of the opinion that everything is either underrated or overrated, so it's not that far of a stretch to say that this movie is underrated, but I think it's the most underrated in the whole of the MCU. I really enjoyed this movie. I took some notes, which of course I left on the other side of the room, so I gotta go get those, but I want to talk about it, and since who knows when it's gonna be before we get another Hulk movie, thank you Universal Studios, um, we're talking about it now, because the Abomination is finally back, so let me grab my notes, and I'm going to talk about The Incredible Hulk. All right, so first of all, I think Ed Norton plays the better banner between him and Ruffalo. And I understand that he didn't really work great with the other people, and he tried to take a lot of... And I understand why he was recast, but I think his banner is way better than Ruffalo's banner. And so I just wish... There was a universe that I could see where he continued playing Bruce Banner throughout the films. I'm not mad that they recast him. I understand why it happened. I just wish that I could see what it would have been like if he had stayed in the role. But some things about the Banner character that we get in this film that they kind of drop in the later films um, is his cleverness and his resourcefulness. So we see that he's made these makeshift uh, science tools, the centrifuge, I think is what it's called, and all these different little things so that he can do his experiments in this, you know, apartment, just with things that he's found, tires and, and things like that. And every time we see Mark Ruffalo's banner, he's got state-of-the-art lab equipment that he's working with. So it's like, yeah, he's a genius, but he's also using top-of-the-line stuff. This banner had to make do with what he could find in dumpsters and things like that. And he still made it work. I think that's really interesting. And I think it really highlights how smart he is. Not just that he's smart, but how smart he is. How resourceful he is. Um, we see that same kind of thinking later on in the film when he swallows the USB drive. Because he's so concerned that they're going to take it and destroy the data. So how does he keep it safe? He eats it! <laughs> um... Which, I don't know if it's a reference, then, in the Avengers, when Black Widow goes to get um, Bruce Banner, and she mentions the cube, and he says, what does Fury want me to do, swallow it? Because that's a thing that he does with important objects sometimes, is swallow it. Um, but just that that kind of um, attention to detail, and, and like I said, the resourcefulness, it picks up... You know, the relationship between this movie and the 2003 Hulk movie, it's a little complicated, but it kind of picks up from there. And in that movie, you know, certain things happen because somebody got a hair of his. So in this movie, he's wearing a hat. He keeps his shirt tucked in. You know, there's that bit where Betty, you know, tells him that it looks better untucked, but he keeps it tucked in because he doesn't... He's paying attention to that stuff. When he loses his drop of blood, he's got the super glue on hand to immediately um, stop the blood from spreading although it is a little bit ridiculous that he he sees the one drop and cleans that up but doesn't see the drop on the bottle like three feet away but i'm fine i'm fine with it it's fine um but that that whole attention to detail of he doesn't want his dna getting out that's completely dropped in all the films with ruffalo he he, he never wears a hat he's always got his big voluminous hair there's, you know, multiple times where the Hulk bleeds, um, you know, and he, it's, there's no comment or mention of it made. He doesn't, you know, say that, oh, well, they, you know, S.H.I.E.L.D. has promised that they're going to, you know, destroy it. Like, I feel like it could have been addressed or it could have been continued on and they didn't do either. They just ignored it. Um, and I think that's an important part of the fear of being the Hulk is that it's not just you, but people that are after your DNA, 
people like Ross who want to get it and weaponize it. Um, and I think it's strange and sad that they just totally dropped that aspect of the character. So he's not careful anymore, and he doesn't need to be resourceful anymore. He just gets all the Tony Stark's top-of-the-line stuff. And I think it's a more boring banner. I think he's a less interesting character. So part of it is that I think Ed Norton plays Banner better. Part of it is that I think it's written better. And maybe that was Ed Norton too, depending on who you listen to and who you believe. But I, this is, I think, the best banner. It's also, I think, my favorite Hulk. I don't know that I'd say that it's the best Hulk. But I think I prefer this version of Hulk over the Avengers version. The CGI doesn't quite hold up. It's not perfect. But I prefer the more muscular, um, savage type of Hulk in this movie over the more ape-like and kind of, I don't know, bumbling version of the Hulk that we get in the later movies. I don't dislike the newer Hulks. I just, in my head, when I think of the Hulk, I think of the version from this movie. And it's weird that they went so different with it, you know? It's like, not only did they recast Banner, but they completely changed the Hulk's design um, with no real explanation as to why. You know, they made him look more like Mark Ruffalo, which I think has some benefits in the stories where you have both Ruffalo and Hulk, but, you know, they could have, again, a line of dialogue about how he's been controlling it more and their, you know, two personalities becoming one more. But we don't get any of that. It's just completely different. And this, the frustrating part of that is that because of things like that, people then go on to claim that this is not canon in the MCU. And it is. <laughs> but they just kind of ignore a lot of things about it. Um, which is just annoying as a fan of the movie. Um, it's annoying. But this movie, it did a lot of um, a lot of work setting up the start of the universe. We've got references to Captain America. They talk about the super soldier serum. And we see different um, containers and logos and things that are very similar to things that we saw in Captain America the First Avenger, which came out after this movie. But uh, we reference the Super Soldier Serum that they, and they even say that it was developed in World War II. We get um, Stark Industries logos throughout, and Tony Stark's name is seen at different parts in the movie. And then, of course, Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark comes in at the very end of the movie. We get uh, Nick Fury's name pop up on screen a couple times, and the Shield logo is pretty prominently seen during the movie. And we um, get Culver University, which is where Betty Ross works, but also Jane Foster either works there or does her research there. I don't remember exactly what it is, but that's a connection to Thor also through Jane Foster. And um, I'm not sure if Eric Selvig works there or if maybe he, you know, he worked with Jane there or if maybe he met Jane there. I... I'm not 100% sure of all the ties, but we get ties to Captain America, Iron Man, and Thor in this movie. This is the, only the second movie in the MCU, only after Iron Man, and we're already setting up things for Captain America and for Thor and tying into Iron Man and S.H.I.E.L.D. and Nick Fury. We get um, a couple cameos of Jack McGee, who was the reporter in the Bill Bixby series, which I have most of the seasons right here. Um, and Jim Wilson, who in the comics is one of the nephews of the Falcon, Sam Wilson. And this is way before the Falcon was ever in the MCU. And in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, the Disney Plus series, we see two other nephews of Sam Wilson, but neither of them is uh, Jim Wilson. I forget what their names are, but they're not, they're not Jim. Um... So it's kind of unclear whether this is the Falcon's nephew in this universe or if it's just a reference to the comics. We get uh, Rick Jones' name on screen. 
So people like me that read early Hulk comics where he was working uh, with Rick Jones a lot. That was kind of neat for us to see. Uh, we get Martin Starr's character, who isn't named in this movie. I don't know if he has a name in the credits. I didn't pay that much attention. But he's also in the Tom Holland Spider-Man movies, um, where he is Roger Harrington, which comes from more modern comics than what I've gotten to, but... Is he's from Spider-Man comics, and so he's him and um, General Ross are the only two characters whose actors come back uh, so far in the MCU. Kind of, kind of odd, kind of strange, but we get him in this movie. Obviously, we get the Lou Ferrigno uh, cameo. We get Bill Bixby cameo on the TV, and other references to the Bill Bixby series. Um, some of the shots of the experimentation with the, the green laser going on to his forehead is very reminiscent of Bill Bixby. We get hints of the musical theme of the Incredible Hulk TV series with Bill Bixby. Um, I feel like I had another note. Oh, the eyes. The shot of the green eyes the first time that he transforms in this movie. Very reminiscent of Bill Bixby. So we get references to Bill Bixby. We kind of carry on from the 2003 movie. And we are um, setting up threads for future movies. So this movie does a lot. And it does not get enough credit for all that it does. I really like the Days Without Incident counter that pops up in the corners every once in a while. I realize that that might not fit well in the other movies that Hulk is in because they're not Hulk movies, but that's just kind of a neat thing uh, for the audience to be in on. Um, what else have I written here? Uh, do, do, do. Liv Tyler and Ty Burrow. Okay, so for me, the two weakest points of this movie are Liv Tyler and Ty Burrell. I don't know if it's Burrell or Burrell. I don't know. I don't care. I don't like either one of them. Liv Tyler never speaks. She either whispers or she screams. She never speaks in a normal tone, and it drives me crazy. I'm glad she wasn't in any of the other movies. And Ty, Ty Burrell, I don't mind him generally. I find him kind of annoying, but that's okay. But, you know, they cast him as Doc Samson, and I know he's not Doc Samson yet, but that's about as far from a Doc Samson type as you could be. Um, so it's really one of those castings of like, this guy saw him in this thing and he liked him, so he put him in this thing. And it's like, you could have picked someone else that would have been a better representation of the character. And if you're not going to try to represent the character, why make him that character? Just make him a different character. But speaking of Liv Tyler and Ty Burrell, I wrote down, how do Betty's relationships work? Because I forget how long Bruce is supposed to have been on the run for at the beginning of this movie. But it's a long time. So she hasn't been with Bruce for a long time. She's in this other relationship with this other guy. They're out on a date. And she thinks that she sees Bruce. And she just she's just like, bye. And bails on him. Goes, spends the night with Bruce. He ta uh, Doc Samson's not around. For a while. Until the scene of the battle at Culver University. And then Doc Sampson is sitting on presumably Betty's porch. Um, talking with General Ross. And he seems to imply that he knew about Bruce. And he also seems to not be upset at Betty. So it's just like, does she start her relationships by telling her dates hey, by the way, there's this guy that I haven't seen in several months to several years, and if I happen to see him, then you and I, we're basically done because I'm, I'm, I'm with this guy now. Like, it's very bizarre to me. Um, Betty's, Betty's a bad girlfriend <laughs> to everyone except Bruce, but I don't like Liv Tyler anyway, so it didn't really bother me. It's just like, how does that work? You know, is that supposed to show that... He, that Doc Samson is such a good guy because he gets it because he understands it. But, like, how did he know about it? Did she really tell him? That seems awkward. Anyway, moving on. Um, so, yeah, Civil War, Captain America Civil War, 
the first time we got Ross back, now he's Secretary Ross, promoted from General. And, you know, people like me that liked this movie, we were really excited about it. He came back in uh, Avengers Endgame. I can't remember if he was in Infinity War or not. Um, I'm pretty sure he was in Endgame, though. Um, he was in some of the digital marketing, um, the WHIH digital shorts that they did um, while promoting these other movies. So, he's been back for a while. Now we're getting the Abomination back in um, Shang-Chi. I'm curious whether it's the actor that portrayed him, who I can't remember his name, if he's still going to voice him or if Blons Blonsky out of Abomination form is going to make any kind of appearance. I don't imagine the Abomination is going to be in it much. It's probably going to be just that one fight scene and they're probably going to move on. I don't, I don't know. I would be surprised if they do any more than that. But man, if we can get Ross and we can get Abomination, when can we get the leader? <laughs> Such a tease. Poor Tim Blake Nelson. He had this and then Fan Four Stick, as people call it, the Fantastic Four gritty reboot where he was supposed to eventually turn into the Mole Man. He keeps playing guys that are going to turn into villains in movies that never happened. The poor guy, I feel for him. But man, seeing the leader as a different kind of challenge to the Hulk rather than something that he can just punch uh, and win, that would be interesting. But no, we just keep seeing Hulk punch things. <sighs> so I'm holding out hope that someday. And I know, I know about the tie in comics. I know. But come on, I want to see the leader. I want to see the leader in a movie. Even if it's not a Hulk movie. At some point, probably whenever She-Hulk gets ready to drop on Disney+, Plus, I'm going to go through all the MC movies with the Hulk in them, like I did with my Black Widow uh, video lead-up to the Black Widow movie. So we'll, we'll pay more attention to the Hulk later on. But bring back leader. Come on. Let's get it. Let's get it done. All right. What else do I have in my notes? That might be... Oh! The Apollo Theater! I think this is the first time that I've ever noticed it. Because I think this is the first time I've watched this movie since I've read Luke Cage comics. Luke Cage was not one of the comics that I read as a kid. Um, but when the show was getting ready to start on Netflix, or maybe after I watched the show on Netflix and I enjoyed it. I don't remember the timeline, but somewhere around the time that it was released on Netflix, I bought... Uh, a bunch of Luke Cage, old Luke Cage comics, and just started reading some of them. And so, when I was re-watching The Incredible Hulk, I knew they were in Harlem, and I knew that Harlem was, you know, Luke Cage's territory in the comics. But watching it, I saw the sign for the Apollo Theater, and I'm like, that's the thing from Luke Cage, right? And I looked it up just to make sure that it wasn't wrong, and I wasn't. So, um... You know, again, going back to all the ways that this helped set up and kickstart the MCU, even though it was the second movie. It still did a lot of the work up top. And it's like, how many things in here were put in as maybes, right? Because people like to give the MCU credit for being so well planned out. And I talk about this in more detail in my video about how the Fast and Furious saga used the Marvel method before the MCU did. But... Early on, there were a lot of things that changed. Um, their plans changed and what they did changed. And I wonder if this is one of them. If this was supposed to be a setup for Luke Cage. I remember there were rumors in the Thor movie that one of the security guards that uh, Thor fights was Luke Cage. Perhaps a pre-powered uh, Luke Cage. But we get what I assume is a Luke Cage reference in here with the Apollo Theater sign being in Harlem. We also get the ending, which is ambiguous as to whether or not Banner is now controlling the Hulk for good, or if he's kind of giving into it and becoming more of a villain. Because in the early of the first Avengers comic, they had to team up to fight the Hulk, who had been manipulated by Loki into causing some harm. So there was there were theories that Hulk was going to be the villain of the first Avengers. And so with this ending, it kind of looks like maybe he's going to the evil side. Um, but it was ambiguous. There was um, there's a scene 
where he takes Betty after the fight at Culver University into the mountains, woods, wilderness, whatever, and there's a big thunderstorm. And I remember when this movie came out, there were theories that Thor was in that scene somewhere, and people were saying, oh yeah, you can totally see him, you can totally see him. And I would go through frame by frame, and he's not there, but that's one of those things that if they had decided to do something like that later on, because this was before the Thor movie, that could have retroactively been the first you know, instance of Thor on screen in the MCU. Obviously, someone will yell at me if I don't talk about the alternate uh, beginning where he tries to shoot himself in the Arctic and we see um, some Captain America remains. So there was theories for a while that that was how Captain America woke up, which ended up not being true based on what actually happened in Captain America the First Avenger. But all these little things that they put in some of which did end up connecting, some of which didn't end up connecting, but might have, uh, depending on how things progressed in the real world. Um, and it makes me wonder how many other things I missed, right? How many things were put in as a potential uh, reference or setup that just didn't end up happening because their plans changed. But man, if it's been a minute since you watched The Incredible Hulk, do yourself a favor. Check it out again. Like I said, CGI is not perfect, but it's still pretty good. Um, I think the best fight in this is the Hulk and Blonsky fight after Blonsky has gotten the injections, but before he becomes the Abomination. Uh, the ending fight I don't think is fantastic. I think it's fine. But when it's Blonsky in his human, enhanced human form going up against the Hulk and it's daylight and you can see things and it's not you know s darkness and smoke um and you got the sonic weapons there and the helicopters and everything i think that's i think that's the best scene um for my money anyway so that's me gushing about the incredible hulk for 20 plus minutes like i said if, you ha if it's been a while since you've seen it Go back, check it out. It's pretty good. I like it a lot. You get the you get the parkour that was big back in the day. Um, <laughs> I did have a moment where I'm watching it where towards the end, I knew it was coming before it popped up because I've seen the movie so many times. We see it's it's the establishing shot. I think is the Statue of Liberty. It's somewhere where Betty Ross is standing, and I know in my head that oh her camera's about to beep. Because the battery is dying, and then she's going to see that picture of Bruce, and I'm just like, wow, 2008 was a while ago. People still used <laughs> cameras, because people don't use cameras anymore. They use their phones. I'm using my phone right now to record this. Um, so, yeah, it's a, you know, it's 13. Is my math right? 13 years old now. So, it, it's been a while, but it's still pretty good. Uh, I don't dislike Ruffalo. I just think Norton did a better banner. And I know, I, can't, I, I said I was done, but I, can't, I keep going. I, I heard someone talking once, and I don't remember if it was the director, because maybe I watched this with the director's commentary, or if it was someone else. But they talk about, uh, especially at the beginning of this movie, Ed Norton has no one to act against, no one to act with. Um, he's by himself with his dog, so he does some talking to his dog, and you get the, the text communication with, uh, with Stearns. But that's a challenge to act in a scene and to carry a scene with no other characters. And I don't know. I don't, you know, I don't want to gush too much on Ed Norton because I know he's not great to work with, but I think he did really well in this movie. Best Banner, my favorite Hulk. A lot of great references, both to old Hulk properties and setting up uh, future Marvel properties. Liv Tyler and Ty Burrell can stay out of the MCU moving forward. That's fine with me. But that's my thoughts on The Incredible Hulk from 2008. Thank you for watching. That's all I've got. Have a good day.